from Las Vegas, it's the Q. EMC World 2016, brought to you by EMC. Now, here are your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Hey, welcome back everyone. We are here live at EMC World 2016. This is SiliconANGLE Media's The Cube. It's our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest is Jeroen Van Rotterdam, CTO of EMC Enterprise Content Division. Uh, all the greatest we've heard today, the big announcements. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks for having me. So big announcements, you got Horizon now called Leap. Info Archive's been announced. 4.0, yes. What's the story with this? Because you know, we've been talking earlier about everybody's on this digital transformation. Right. But you have an old way and new way going on. Kind of like traditional, even on the keynotes, and then emerging. Everyone wants to digitize everything. But right. not everyone has everything in the format. They might have systems, and software, mm -hmm. collaborative, enterprise software, but the shift to this new digital asset-driven content market, non-linear consumption, and so on and so forth. What's the big it's underpinnings? It's an exciting world, and in, in, in the world of content, you know, what we do with Document, I think is relatively unique, we are going for a very optimized hybrid cloud strategy. A lot of our customers are very conservative, they have a very large scale documentum installation on premise. They invest a lot of dollars in that and it's optimizing their business processes. But they want to have the agility of the cloud. And so we announced Leap with a bunch of productivity apps in the cloud where you get that agility that is complementary to our on premise documentum installed base. Yeah. So they have pre existing they have pre existing investments. So they don't want to rip and replace. No, no. They no. want but they also want that benefit of a clean sheet of paper be cloud natives, that's kind of what you're getting at? Yep, yep, that's what we're saying, and so the two work better together as we said, right? Yeah. High velocity agility in the cloud versus a stable base, your system of record on-prem. So we hear all this all the time, all the different shows we go to, systems of record, that's the database, system engagement, this new interaction, relationship with the customers, and now insight or cognitive or intelligent, data, content. It's, it's slightly different though with Documentum, right? So Documentum is, it's not a database, it's the heart of the process flow around content. So the business processes are optimized using Documentum. And that's the system of record with a lot of process and integrations around that. Now we're adding agility with cloud a system of engagement basically, right? So productivity apps, and our approach is different as well. Instead of going for a monolithic app in the cloud, we go for slivers of functionality that are highly optimized for a specific purpose. Good example is review yeah. and approve on a mobile device. And that optimized that in a single purpose app yeah. with you know, very rapid cadence of innovation. So these new, these new work streams, basically what you're saying. So the old way was, you had a database, and the old way, let's just use data as an example. A schema defines the function, and content or software will def define what you can do. What you're saying is, they're defining their workflows or streams around the content or the content dictates No, it's really the business process is typically uh, leading. Mm -hmm. and, and, and frankly, there are a lot of business processes that cross the enterprise boundary as well. Oh, yeah. So what we do with Leap, we have a set of productivity apps where you can invite external users yeah. to contribute content to- Outside the company. Outside of the company, right? To submit documents in a very controlled way and then integrate back into your base business process. Are we going to talk about InfoArchive today as well or not? <laughs> Are we? <laughs> yeah, of course. Well, yeah. so I want to ask you about the business process. So how do your customers deal with the hardening of that process and how does InfoArchive and other tooling evolve with that? So InfoArchive is a better to get a story as well, right? So InfoArchive is an optimized platform for static content and data, structured and unstructured data. And you have a set of leap productivity apps in the cloud, so for instance, Snap for distributed capture of data, you're capturing static contracts, uh, co content, like images, or you have um, Courier where you capture static documents like contracts. That content is not, is not changing, so flowing that into InfoArchive, where it's a highly optimized platform at scale, you know, petabyte scale for that static data, that's a better to get a story. And sometimes you got Documentum customers where they have a lot of uh, business processes around documents, 
they modify a lot, a lot of documents, but they reach a static state. Offloading the static content into InfoArchive is a better to get a story as mm -hmm. well. So, okay, so you got scale. How heavy is it? How, you know, what's the footprint like? So InfoArchive is a very lightweight architecture. We actually redesigned the architecture to, first of all, scale out. So every aspect of that architecture is horizontal scalable. It's a cluster strategy, a cluster architecture in every layer of the stack. It's also extremely lightweight. We demonstrated today in the keynote on a Raspberry Pi, a $35 computer, with the full info archive solution running on top of it with all the three servers. So very lightweight, yep. but scales out. And the reason why lightweight is so important is there are new privacy regulations popping up all over the place in Europe and, and across the world, yep. which forces big global enterprises to have a local archive in the country, geo-fenced. So yeah. you cannot have like, you know, this global archive in one, two or three sites anymore. Yeah. Suddenly you have to have 50 instances of your archive. And, you know, rolling out the traditional archiving solutions in 50 locations is super expensive. Well, so you got to make it smart too. It's, it's got to be intelligent too to know where to, the geofence is too, right? It is, it is. So we reroute the data to the right, you know, archive endpoint. Hmm. But doing that in a very cost-effective way at a global scale with so many instances, that's what InfoArchive does. And, and you said it scales that's to good. petabytes? That's beautiful. Oh yeah, you know, we, we've got customers now that they have uh, a good example, is a customer with 40 billion objects, structured data in a single archive, four billion documents, and that runs on a three core machine. Um, with 60,000 queries per day against that data because that data is now actively used. And, um, you know, it's very, it's not uncommon that a big financial institute has like 50 petabyte of email alone. And in a dot frank scenario now, you have to collect all the transactions, all the communications like email, voice recordings, call records, IM, social media data, all together in a single archive. Yeah. And well, that's a mix of unstructured data and structured data too, right? That's a, that's the strength of our platform. We 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 optimize for both. And your pricing model? How do you price to capacity? So that's the beauty, right? So InfoArchive is based on consumption-based pricing. So it's terabyte based. So when you get the benefit of the archive, we charge you. And so you know, a lot of customers, it's a land and expand model, right? A lot of customers start small they get an immediate return of that small instance, and then they, 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 they see the light, right? So they add more and more data streams to the, to the archive. How unique is this in the marketplace? Can you compare and contrast with other products? Yeah, I think we are unique in, in terms of um, the scale, the lightweight of the architecture, the fact that we do in-place compliance. So we, we have a very strong compliance engine, and a lot of our competing products when, when compliance controls change or rules change, they have to refeed the data. Or, um, um, well, refeed the data refeed. means that you mean you have to export the data out of the archive and bring it back and in. And re-index. Oh yeah, it's horrible, right? So uh, yeah. your retention policies change. That's the last thing you want to do. Yeah. So what we do is we do in-place compliance. What that means is that our legal holds, retention policies, and, and, and uh, and, and, and security policies around the data are have an indirection model against the repository. So when retention policies change, and they will change, you don't have to change to touch the data. It, and that's a virtual repository as you described before, basically, right? It, so what do you mean by a virtual well, repository? Well, so you said that you, you have to have in-country you know, yeah, so, you know, so it's a distributed right. repository. So it's, it's not a single physical shove it in a box kind of repository. No, it's not, it's right? not. Absolutely. That's what I mean by virtual. Okay, so back to the things for customers. What are you seeing in the conversations you talk to customers, the top three features that they like the most? So um, there's always a compliance aspect to this. So the fact that we are so flexible around compliance controls is a big, is a big one. Yeah. Second is scale. All of our customers have silos of archives. It's very expensive. Um, and, and, and it's actually growing and growing. Third is that we have specified spe specific solutions on top of the core platform. For instance, for SAP archiving or clinical archiving, so EMR data. 
that really reduces the cost of implementing a large-scale archive in a compliant way. Okay, so I got to ask you the question that we're seeing a lot of um, conversations on the interviews that we do, and, and our own experience is around data. Um, better together is definitely a great message, and that's something that we're hearing from everybody. So taking that to the next level of data silos, because right now people have, have pre-packaged apps because of the either it's a one-off point solution, yep, yep, and yep. they have a database, but the data now talking to each other becomes interesting because you have omni-channel-like interactions, engagement data coming in from whether it's lightweight, cloud, yep. or purpose-built for like geofencing, like you mentioned. So all the stuff's going on out there around the database, but yet it might be really critical to have real-time information talk to another system or app within the framework. How do you guys look at that, and what's your vision around this data interaction, data sharing? So in, in terms of bringing data together, we definitely have a strategy to have, to, to be the central archive for many different applications, and these applications can do multi-channel publishing on, them, on their own, right? And specifically in FinServe, right, you have to cut across all the data from all applications to get insight in when you have an audit, for instance, right? Um, the second, what we see now is that we went from being a, an, an archive at scale with a compliant en compliance engine where we added very flexible discovery interfaces that you can configure using drag and drop in the browser, we now see a need to actually do real-time analytics over the data. So we're investing now, this is the next round, we're investing in real-time analytics over data streams coming into the archive before you collect the evidence in that central archive. So like machine learning or some sort of yep, algorithmic yep, so insight, the surface insights and then... Yeah, we're actually presenting that. So the, um, it's, not, it's not just machine learning, it's a combination of NLP yeah. as well as statistical analysis and machine learning. And, it, and we're doing that over structured and unstructured data. And there are new techni techniques to do machine learning over unstructured data that are really interesting. And how does this relate? So we talk about scale a lot. One of the complaints that customers would have frequently is the technology might scale, but the, the model didn't because I couldn't classify my data um, yeah, yeah. at the point of creation or use. So what is the status of that sort of capability? You know, I, I think manual classification is a thing from the past. The volumes are too high. The data models are changing on the fly. We see sort of a move towards control by the end user. So end users start to, through configuration, start to define dynamic data models. Mm -hmm. That means your data model is changing on the fly, and therefore your classification will have to change on the fly as well. And so discrete taxonomies defined by hand are just not doable anymore. Right. And the machine learning algorithms are so good now, and the, you know, the entity recognitions or core NLP, the NLP type of algorithms are so good that you can really automate that well, now we have the big bot, the bot so that problem now. is essentially solved. And it's it has, being solved. It, it, it's still early days, but okay. it's being solved. Okay, but that's the, that's, the, that's the technique to solve it now, is NLP yep. and machine learning. And, yep. Yep. and automation to, too, you see bots out cause, there. Because there were some attempts to use math, you know, support vector machines, uh, yeah, latent so vector, semantic so indexing was yeah, another so, technique. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about vector, the, the, the opportunity with vectorization of unstructured data. Which is very well understood, yeah. it's been around for decades, right? No, it, no, it's actually not, so if you, there, I mean, the concept has, the, yeah. the, concept the math has, has been But around. now the data sets are different, they're real time, so you got but, unstructured data. But the implementation hasn't been around, right? No, it, well, it hasn't, so, yeah. uh, you know, if you look at technologies like Word2Vec or Glove from Stanford, right, so. Yeah, yeah, okay. These technologies are, are only available, with, you know, less than two years now. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 2014 or 2013 was the first paper for vectorization of text. And the interesting technology is there that it doesn't do just statistical analysis on how words in a context are related. It actually can do automatic reasoning over the data as well, which is still poorly understood. So yeah, yeah. I think that- But meta reasoning is a great concept because if you can automate that, you're facilitating some complexity inside the discovery piece. Around right, and so so tied back to to info archive, right? So yeah. we're getting really, really popular in the financial services space. Mm. They all have the compliance requirements to archive all that data and correlate that. They all have to the requirements to do e-discovery over this massive amount of data. 
and then they, there's fraud, de fraud detection by auditors, but they really want to do fraud prevention. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So the name of the game is we want to prevent well, then fraud in the Well, security on that too, it's even more complicated. But this yeah, is a game so, but changer. We have a good handle on the security controls over that data. But this, this is a game changer, because for, for a long time, the industry was using search as a blunt instrument. Yeah, but know, it, it's, it's, not it's not good enough. It's not good, good enough, enough. Right. yeah. There's still, you know, lots and lots of um, manual auditors or, you know, surveillance going yeah. on within the FinServe industry. Mm. Drew, and I'd like you to, uh, first of all, thank you for coming on theCUBE, sharing your insights here. Inside My the pleasure. Cube. You're My like pleasure. a machine learning machine here inside the Cube. But I want you to take a, a minute and, and share with the folks watching, what, what is the insights coming out of this show for you guys? Because you guys have a lot of announcements. Break it down for the, for the potential customers watching. What's the big message? What are you guys proposing here? What, and how do they get more information? You know, I think our big message is that we're setting the pace for the next generation of enterprise content management. We think we have a very solid hybrid cloud strategy with a combination of on-premise and SaaS technologies with the agility they need. And so I think we're unique in sort of defining the next strategy for content management, enterprise content management. And with that, on the info archive side, we're really redefining on how data comes together, how you get insights into data, whether it's through analytics tools like MapReduce over a secure environment, mm -hmm. or moving into real-time analytics. And it's more than just marketing cloud software, it's really infrastructure-related software. It's both, right? It's, it's, it's not just infrastructure, this is business process yeah. and content-centric and data-centric yeah. value that we bring. Content is king, and we are bringing you a lot of content here in theCUBE, and making the content smart, addressable, non-linear consumption. This is the cloud, it's agile, it's DevOps, all this is great stuff in the digital transformation, the effort to digitize everything. Thank you so much, Drew, for, for sharing your insight and content on theCUBE, which is a content machine. We'll be right back with more action live here in Las Vegas for EMC World 2016. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. You're watching theCUBE. It's always fun to come back to theCUBE because, you know, the, the discussion